Welcome to Ginyan 101, Khai Nghiệp Lam Yao. I'm your host, Tui Fan. When you create a business, not many look ahead to what happens when it's time to plan an exit strategy. Starting is important, but knowing when to move on or sell your business or where it goes next is just as important. Join us as we talk to Ed Hart, the Director of Family Business at Cal State Fullerton, on what you need to know to be ready and how to do good family business. In America, family businesses make up over 70% of small businesses, and that can be both a good and bad thing. Working in a family business, we always talk about how, you know, if any of us come from a family, and most of us do, there's conflict. If any of us have a job, there's typically some conflict there. So when you put the two together, how do we prepare for that conflict? And not that everything about working in family business is conflict related, but certainly when emotions come into play and you're working with family. Uh, we always advise and counsel our students and those that work within the family businesses that we serve to make sure you put your family first. Uh, that's our philosophy, that's my personal philosophy, is that family over business all the time. It means you're working with people you love and trust, but it can also mean a lot of hard decisions. Ed Hart, who's the director of the Center for Family Business at Cal State Fullerton, says the key is making sure there's communication. For me, what I've noticed is the companies that have uh, great similar shared values. So everybody across the board within the family and the company shares a very a similar value system, uh, meaning that they, they value work about the same way they value their community involvement, they value that maybe their church or their other civic organizations that they maybe belong to, that that's consistent. And then the big deal to me, and it's really, this is the answer I think to every relationship is communication. That there's open dialogue and open discussion. I can kind of answer that question with the flip side of what I've seen in companies that don't succeed is communication's not there. Parents assume the kids know they're going to be taking over the business. Kids assume the parents are going to transition it or vice versa. And so when the communication's not there, that's when we see a breakdown. So we take that and we flip it. And we just, not that we want them to over communicate and to be talking about literally everything all day long because you'll never get any work done. But at the same time, communication on those values and communication on the vision for the organization across the generations, I think is critical. Hart says one thing most people don't talk about in family business is succession planning. It's funny because when somebody asks me when should I start talking to my kids about succession planning, my response is always now, <laughs> regardless of they're three years old or 33 years old. And some of that is serious and some of that is, is just joking, but I, I believe you want to expose your kids to the business at an early age. It doesn't mean have them come in at five years old and start filing and, and sweeping the floors necessarily. But talk about it. Talk about it at the dinner table with balance. Again, you want to leave work at work and, and home life at home life. But I think that there should be some balance to gauge the, the level of interest in the children, um, to gauge their, their aptitude. Some kids would really be interested in taking over the business, but maybe it's a law firm and they don't have any legal experience or any desire to have legal experience. Um, so I think it's just a case-by-case -case scenario with your kids is to just, just talk to them about it, find out what their level of interest and what their aptitude is, give them opportunities. Uh, we encourage a lot of the family businesses that we work with to make sure that their children get a good education, that they then go out and get a job somewhere outside the family business so they can learn what it's like to have to create a resume, to learn what it's like to manage people, to work with other people, um, to work their way up the ladder, so to speak, in a company. Because oftentimes what happens, and I know I'm giving you more of an answer than you asked, but oftentimes what happens in a family business, and one of the reasons why there is failure in family-owned companies is the family will just promote their kids because they have the right last name. And so they're just born into that. If you're a Smith, you're going to take over you know, Smith Automotive or whatever the company may be um, without really encouraging them or, or telling them they need to go get an education and some work experience outside the business. Even if the business isn't family owned, succession planning is imperative so you know where the company will go once your role in it ends. Um, we can never be fully prepared. We talk about the law of threes a lot in business. I was just talking about this with a client last night. It's typically going to take you three times as long as you thought. If you're starting a business, it's going to take you three times as long as you thought to get to the revenue figures that you thought you were going to make it's probably going to cost you three times as much money to get there as you thought because there's unforeseen expenses in marketing and taxes and licensing and all these other things that you need to get. And then most likely in the first year, you're going to make about the, a third of the money you thought you were going to make. So go in eyes wide open, prepared to work a lot harder than you thought you were going to have to. I love that people leave their 40-hour-a-week job to go start up a business and end up working 80 hours a week for half the money. 
but they do it because they have the passion and they see the vision of this growing forward and there's the, there's the opportunity on the horizon that may not exist where they currently are. So I think that's why a lot of people start a business, even though they, they like you said, they may not know what they don't know because they've never done it. It's like anything, first time you climb a mountain, you're, you have no idea what's on the other side of that next peak until you get there and you see it and you have to suddenly prepare for it. All organizations, no matter their size, need succession planning. To do so, set a strategic plan that identifies the organization's vision, mission, and values. These are vital elements in determining future staffing needs. Next, create an inventory of existing skill sets. Assessing your employees is an integral part of succession planning. You need to know what storehouse of skills and knowledge you already have in-house. Then you can determine what gaps exist compared to your personnel plans and go from there. Next, ask people where they would like to be. In open, transparent succession, you invite employees to privately talk about their preferred future roles within your company. An honest conversation assists both of you in realistic ways. Next, evaluate each person's future potential. While people may tell you where they prefer to be assigned, you need to determine whether or not this is truly practical. Each employee's current skills, their motivation level, and ability to adapt and grow must be taken into account. Next, inform employees of their succession potential. Tell high potentials that they're ripe for the fast track. Faulty logic can drive companies to withhold information about an employee's potential. They fear that disappointed staff who are not high potential will run for the door, or that high potential employees will act overly entitled. High potential employees need to be told about their status or they will likely explore other options. Next, groom according to skill sets, desired trajectory, and potential. Performance management should be geared to helping employees reach their maximum potential. After each succession planning conversation, managers should have a list of gaps that must be closed to ensure succession can take place. Finally, offer retention programs that help ensure key staff will stay. Succession planning isn't effective if your employees leave prematurely. All that training and potential walking out the door is cause for concern. You can minimize the risk of unplanned departures by motivating your staff to stay. Houston Councilman Steve Lee says families in the Vietnamese community can plan for succession by encouraging their children in areas that they may help later on. Riêng ở bên Mỹ này nó hay một cái là người nào mà có cái sáng kiến hay sáng kiến tốt đưa ra đầu tiên là người đó sẽ thành công. Thì mình phải suy nghĩ là nếu mà cái mục đích của mình thành lập ra một cái mom and pop store để mà nuôi cho con cháu sau này học và có một cái nghề nghiệp vững bền thì ok thì như vậy thì mình là chấm dứt sau cái đời của mình là mình chấm dứt mình không có làm thêm còn hả nếu mà mình muốn cho con cái mình nó tiếp tục cái con đường của mình à, chẳng hạn như đây là nhà hàng Kim Sơn rất là thành công thì hồi đó là hai bác Kim Sơn bác Tám á, là có một cái nhà hàng bán lunch buffet rất là nho nhỏ gần trong tại dưới phố này nhưng mà khuyến khích cho con gái đi học rồi lại khuyến khích con cái đi học về cái ngành hospitality để mà sau này trở lại làm một cái hệ thống Kim Sơn à, thì gia đình của Kim Sơn khi mà con cái học xong rồi trở về lấy những cái kiến thức mà đã học uh, hospitality ở tại, uh, tại, tại trường University of Houston để mà thành lập những cái nhà hàng Kim Sơn và cái cách điều hành theo người Mỹ Thành ra cái cách service, cái cách bus boy, cái cách cook, cái cách menu, tất cả những cái gì trong nhà hàng đó nó đều có một cái phương pháp, một cái policy, nó theo một cái hệ thống. Thành ra gia đình Kim Sơn rất thành công để mà truyền xuống cho con cái của mình. Thành ra không phải là không làm được, nhưng mà cái chiều hướng của mình mình muốn làm sao? Nếu bây giờ mình muốn cái tiệm nail của mình, nó thành công mà nó theo một cái phương pháp nào đó nó có manager nó có những người làm những người này kia nọ thì mình phải khuyến khích để mà con cái mình nó trước hết là nó phải thích cái ngành đó và khuyến khích cho nó vào cái ngành đó thứ nhì là mình phải có một cái policy và một cái procedure nào đó để cho con cái mình nó theo dõi nó theo cách nó học để mà có thể nó phát triển nhiều hơn Succession planning is essential whether or not it is a family business, but according to Hart, families need to remember to hire not because of ties, but for skills. But really, if you look at the companies that thrive, they are promoting the right people who are the most qualified. And uh, while emotionally that might be difficult, oftentimes because they are your kids and you created this for them in many cases, the companies that really do well are the ones that are promoting the right person who's the most qualified for the job and the kids really need to earn their way into that position. Like I mentioned before, get the education, get the experience. The question I'll ask a family business leader at times is, 
if she wasn't your daughter, would she be in this position or if he wasn't your son? Um, and really, that's, 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 that's kind of the barometer to ask in these family businesses. Would you promote them or place them in that slot if they weren't family? And if the answer is no, then my belief, and again, easier said than done, is to give them the time and the opportunity to get the education and the experience, and that's why going outside sometimes works. Coming up after the break, find out how a love story put crawfish on the map. Stay with us. Welcome back to Gin Yun 101. I'm your host, Twi Fan. Don and her husband Sin are low-key people, but the moment they brought the concept of seafood boils to the West Coast, it started a phenomenon that swept the foodies, and today they have over 19 locations. Find out how they got started and what plans they have for the future of the boiling crab. When Dad and Ngo met her future husband Sin in 1997, she didn't know that he came from a long line of crabbers and that his expertise would one day help build what we know today as the boiling crab. Ngo says in the beginning she only wanted to bring the idea of the down-home crawfish boils to those on the west coast and the idea took off. One day we just decided that we would do it. So that's kind of how the idea came about to start crawfish. It was something that in living on the west coast we recognize they didn't have quite yet and realizing not a lot of people had experienced that seafood type of boil um, if they hadn't been to New Orleans or had family down south as well. So that was something that I was really excited about that I could enjoy and share with my friends on the west coast that had never experienced that as well without having to fly out of state to do that. Yelp and food bloggers were just coming onto the scene and it helped spread through word of mouth. We had a cult-like following very early on, and it was right at the beginning of food blogging and the Food Network channels taking off with the One Chefs and all these chef reality shows and, and, and that nature. And I think what helped was just the strong core of loyalty fans that we had that really believed in, in our concept and really loved what we created that helped carry word of mouth. It, Legitimately, to this day, we, we believe it was all word of mouth and due to the fact of our customers and our employees and everybody who just loved what we stood for. I think the community and where we started um, this little hole in the wall in Garden Grove, knowing that if we failed, they would be the most forgiving as opposed to opening some place in Santa Monica or some place that the expectations might be a little bit higher really helped us to grow into our own and, and experiment and figure things out for ourselves. So we really owe it all to the community that we started in. Lines started forming and the demand for the boiling crab was undeniable. When we first opened in 04, it was legitimately what most would have called a hole in the wall in Garden Grove. Um, it was about 1450 square feet in size, very, very small. So with the long lines and the small kitchen and the tight dining area, we were kind of forced, I would say, to open. We um, were under a lot of pressure to expand just due to the demand. So our goal for expansion was to meet demands. It wasn't so much that we knew we were onto something or that um, that was never our intention to open more than one store. We were perfectly content with one store in the very beginning. That was all we wanted. That was all we had asked for. So anything thereafter has really been a blessing for us and, and, a, and a pleasant surprise. From there they expanded and today have over 19 locations. The bigger perspective on my end is we've now created these stores and I've got all these employees and I've, I, I'm kind of looking out for their future and their best interest and as we grow they grow. So for me that's, that's the silver lining for me is that as I continue to grow not only are we 
going to be able to share this experience with other people. But internally, for my staff and the people that have been with me from the beginning, they're able to grow in their positions and attain and achieve their successful goals, whether it's financial or title or career. Um, so that's kind of what keeps me going, um, is seeing that through our growth, we've helped so many other people achieve their goals as well. Ngo said that one of the toughest parts of dealing with seafood is that it is live and unpredictable. It was difficult for us in the beginning learning how much to order, how much we would go through. Dealing with live seafood was a really big um, lesson for us because obviously the product that you're getting in could dies if it's not um, cooked right away, um, if it's shipped and the weather conditions aren't favorable, your product, you know, you have more to lose than to gain when dealing with live seafood. So that was, that was a bit of a, um, a lesson for us in learning and how to deal with stuff like that. Um, just dealing with, with customers and reviews has also been another lesson. I think business has changed quite a bit since when we've opened. Everybody's a food critic. Um, things go viral, you know, both good and bad. Uh, I think typically speaking, the issues that we've had were very normal from what I, when I've spoken with other business owners, from having difficulties of getting our ABC license in the very beginning, um, just trying to please everybody, um, and making sure that our menu is that there's something for everybody there because I'm recognizing that everybody likes seafood as well. Although Ngo and her husband exemplify the meaning of entrepreneur, she never thinks of herself as one. So that's why I have a hard time labeling myself as an entrepreneur, but I guess in the true sense of the word we are because we dreamt it up, you know, we put it on paper and we executed and we made it happen. We took the steps to make it happen. But I think for me, it's I, I just have a hard time, I mean, I just, because it, I, I, my story I feel like is just so simple and, and ordinary, because I mean, at the end of the day, my husband and I, we just, we love what we do and we work hard and um, we strive to make a better work environment for everybody so that everybody can enjoy their work. Um, and I think my biggest job now is raising my family and ensuring that I'm instilling those values in them to be productive members of society and whatnot, but I do have a hard time labeling myself as this entrepreneur or this, I, I you know, I, I feel like people give us a lot more credit than, than I, I feel I should be receiving because at the end of the day, I wake up, I go to work and I come home and it's just no, no more than what anybody else does. Um, so that's why when someone asks, what's your secret? It's like, you just love what you do. Just, you know, we've always said at one point, if we're not having fun anymore, we should just stop opening. I mean, there's been moments where I've been close to that, but trials and tribulations of, of everyday work, I guess, I guess there's not one person that probably can't say the same thing about their job, whether they're a business owner or not. When we first started sharing our idea of, we think this is what we want to do, we think this is what we're going to do, um, there were a lot of negative, um, responses and one being crawfish is seasonal most of seafood is seasonal you're at the mercy of the weather the climate um, the year before even so a lot of people had asked us what are you gonna do when crawfish is not in season um, well first off I should back up but the name the boiling crab came about because my husband was a crabber he wasn't a crawfish fisherman um, I knew that Generally speaking, most people knew what crab was. I knew not a lot of people knew what crawfish was. So we named the restaurant The Boiling Crab, knowing that people would be drawn in through their love of crab, and in doing so, would be introduced to crawfish. Um, the fact that crawfish took off was an awesome surprise. Since then, we've added things to our menu to help balance when we didn't have crawfish. Um, we've added a bunch of fried dishes for a number of reasons, but we haven't had any issues with crawfish being out of season other than limited times of the year because we're able to bring in you know, frozen crawfish now and we're able to freeze our own crawfish. Um, and there's lots of ways around it. But shrimp has also become a bigger 
selling point for us. So we're able to make up for it in other ways when crawfish isn't in season. One thing you'll notice about the boiling crab is the laid back casual feel and that means bibs and eating with your hands. It was very important to us and a big part of our concept to maintain a sense of casual dining. Um, when we opened we tried to be very clear about you know, we're not fine dining, we're not white linens, we're not your typical Papa Do's, Red Lobster, um, all these other great seafood restaurants out there. We wanted it to be very casual, a place where it was all about the food and not so much about who's coming to eat this food. Um, the, the writing on the wall, that was very organic. It was people who would come in and make their mark. We had a very pure, by the water type of feel that we wanted to carry on and authentically use from my husband's background of fishing and crabbing, um, everything that reminded us of the South or the Gulf of Mexico or New Orleans. So that's kind of where all that came from. We just wanted to ensure that it was about the simplicity of the food and the nature of sharing the food and not so much everything else that came with, with, with dining. So that was an outlet that I think we were really successful in without knowing that it was going to be successful. It's kind of who we are. We consider ourselves country folk, just ordinary people doing what they love to do. So, Moving forward, the Boiling Crab has plans to expand into the global market. For my husband and I, the Boiling Crab is, is like our child that's constantly growing and so we guard it, you know, very um, securely and maintain that anybody who runs it loves it as much as we do. So it's not just something that will help them attain their financial goals, but something that will speak to them, you know, heart and soul and what they love and what they, what they love to eat and what they love to do and what they love to provide um, for, for others to enjoy that and share that experience. So we've decided to stop franchising domestically, which is great for us because the franchisees that we currently have are a family, are our family to us, and it's a tight knit group um, that is able to respect our opinions um, and respect where we want the brand to go. We are, however, franchising internationally because obviously we can't be in Asia or Europe or wherever it is we want to go. Um, so, with that being said, if it's not in my backyard, it's a little bit easier to let go. But we are franchising internationally. Mo says, follow your instincts and give it a try. Know what it is truly and sincerely and genuinely what it is you want to put out there and love what you do so that when you fail, it won't hurt as much because it's something that you loved. Um, and think differently. I think if I had learned to, if I had listened to every negative criticism or every negative um, advice that I was given, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, so I, I felt in my gut if it was something that I would have to prove to myself and if it failed, it failed. We would go right back to working because we're not afraid to work hard. Coming up after the break, we'll talk to the originators of the Fish Tacos by Team of Brothers and show you how Wahoos changed the face of fast casual dining in the U.S. Welcome back to Kenyan 101. I'm your host, Tui Fan. When brothers Mingo, Ed, and Wing got started on their fish tacos restaurant called Wahoos, they didn't think it would turn into a 30-year journey with over 60 locations across the U.S. Join us as we talk to these humble businessmen on how they were able to carve a niche for themselves and what it means to franchise. Brothers Mingo, Ed, and Wing aren't your typical franchise owners. As the children of Chinese immigrants that worked in their parents' restaurant as they grew up, they know what it means to work hard, but they also knew how to play hard. Their idea of Wahoos came from the early days of surfing, and they realized there was nothing like it in Southern California. Well, it's kind of funny. The long, the long version of it is, you know, I went to San Diego State. I used to go down to Mexico surfing all the time. My brother used to go down there on, with his buddies, and it just became a natural that after surfing, whether it was with us or just, you know, friends, we would have fish tacos on the dock. And everybody talked about having a place to hang out in Orange County. 
because you know Mexico is kind of far away, but nobody had the background to do it. Well, luckily for me and my brothers, we had the expertise, the background of having my parents' restaurants. So we said, hey, let's see if we can give it a try. And we opened the very first store in 88 in Costa Mesa, near all the surf companies. And the joke is, if you build it, they'll come, and they did. We, we opened on a shoestring budget. We took over an existing restaurant. We had a friends, family, everybody come in and paint, clean, and, and do everything to get open. So even though there was a risk, uh, at least we were getting into an industry that we felt we had, if you could say, a level of expertise in back when we were 30 years younger. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so I think just because we were comfortable with our background experience and where we grew up. We also have another brother that, you know, was uh, very, very entrepreneurial. So we come from a family of entrepreneurs, my you know, dad uh, leaving China to Brazil to the United States. So uh, our family is used to taking risks. I mean, uh, my parents more than us, but my dad has made uh, um, lots of money and lost lots of money. So we were used to having that in our, in our lives. So it's not something that was new. So we were prepared for a loss. I mean, and Wahoo's was not our first try as a business, as, as partners. So we, we've done other things and we failed. And then we knew uh, that's, you know, let's give it one last shot. If not, I think we ought to tie. Yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> become lawyers. Oh my God. Uh, the menu at Wahoo's is basically a blend of what we liked and what we didn't like. So we, like, we love fish, but we don't like a deep fried. So we always loved another local restaurant, uh, the crab cooker that actually did amazing grilled fishes. And I always thought, why can't we put that inside of a taco? So basically we took the idea of a fish taco that was deep fried, used a much healthier version, which is grilled over you know, uh, the charcoal, and that's the original restaurant. We wanted to have something that was really healthy, but still had you know, all the feeling of Baja. So it's really clean, really simple, but just a little healthier. Today, Wahoo's is known the world over for its California cool, casual fast food style of dining and its fish tacos. I, I think it's a combination. I mean, timing was good for us because back, you know, now everywhere you go, there's this category called fast casual or quick service. But back in the 80s, it really, it was either fast food or sit down. And so we sort of I, I, to help develop a niche in, in, the, in the dining options for customers. But I also think, you know, somebody told me something early on is that the harder you work, the luckier you will be. So I think if you just, you know, it doesn't always work out that way, but we just kept our heads down and grinding it out. And, and there was some, some definite lows along the way, as there are for all entrepreneurs. But I think it, it was good timing and a lot of hard work to go with it. Although it is a family-owned business, Ed says they each have a role and help each other in their business. My department is probably one of the toughest, so if I had to do it uh, all over again and see the mistakes we've made, it's like I wasn't an expert in real estate, so I had to learn a lot on my own. Uh, um, my older brother was an attorney, but he was not a real estate attorney, so if I had to do it all over again, that component of I would have had a, a much stronger broker or a stronger uh, advisor when it came to real estate. And then of course, when it came to construction, we should have oh my God, hire a contractor the first day we open the restaurant. But we said, we're like, I think we can do this, you know, or we can do the tiling ourselves because we're trying to save money, beating costs. So, uh, and then the other part I always tell people is make sure you have a budget. Uh, when you open your own restaurant, a budget that has actually your own personal salary sort of tied in there. Most entrepreneurs think I got to pay rent, I got to pay equipment, I got to pay employees, but they forget that their own personal expenses got to be part of that budget. And I don't think we had that and we we're, you know, and again, we're very blessed that we're able to, when I lost the apartment, go back to my mom's house in Newport. So I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I just got to go back to my mommy's house. So there's, there's so many things that if I could have done differently, yeah, but, but you know, you learn throughout those years of doing that. And again, for me, I looked out that Mingo was always back there, goes, hey, you know, and so if we made a mistake, we wouldn't get super upset. We'd go, now we got to fix it. And, and, you know, having Wing and Mingo helping me out through those, navigating through those mistakes, oh my gosh, it was, you know, th that's priceless. That's when you know your brothers have your back because there's a couple of times where there could have been a lawsuit and we could have lost it all. Based, most of my mistakes, but he, because I didn't know real estate well enough, um, those are tough years. Yeah, but I think, you know, sort of tailing off of that is, you know, c cash flow or working capital is probably the most important thing. E even as we deal with franchisees, uh, we, they come in, and we try to make sure they're well capitalized at the first 12 to 18 months of the business because this is a high mortality business restaurant i think the stat is nine out of ten fail within the first 12 months 
And I, we can't uh, emphasize enough how you need to have that cash sitting in the bank because as soon as your drawers start thinning out a little bit, you start making really bad decisions. You start cutting back on marketing, you start cutting back in staffing, and it's just a self-propelling ball downhill. So you gotta be well capitalized no matter what uh, you know, venture you're jumping into. Because if you can't get through your first winter, well, you're not gonna make it through your first winter. <laughs> Although the brothers are not Vietnamese, their story mirrors the immigrant story that many others go through. Immigrant families, everybody goes to work. I mean, as soon as you got out of school, we're bus boys, we weighed, we weighed tables, we did the dishes, we prepped. So we didn't think that was not normal until you're much older because then you start <laughs> thinking when your friends are like, oh. wow, you know, uh, uh, so to us, is back then you hated it. But then as you got older, that, that was your work ethic. You knew that you were gonna go to school and work after school. Uh, we really went and did other things goofing off. But my parents were also kind enough to give us a break. I mean, my mom and dad are a little bit, not as traditional Chinese, um, very, but they allow us to surf. So as long as we kept good grades, went to work, we were allowed to surf. So that was the only difference, but we were a typical immigrant family. Yeah, and it was, a, I think, you know, it's also typical that they made us all, not made us, but requested that we all get our college degrees and get advanced degrees if for those who chose to do it. And, and part of the plan was never to go back in the restaurant business. They almost uh, basically forbid us to do it. But, you know, the, uh, reluctantly, they, they saw that we had a passion for the business. And so the three younger of five boys got into the restaurant business where we were supposed to leave and never turn around. <laughs> Our goal was just to open one store and kind of run it well and see if we can all take sort of time off. I mean, our parents worked really hard, like 60 to 80 hours a week, and we were thinking 35, 40 each brother, and then, you know, taking that route. Uh, me and when I made the, put the menu together in the back of a napkin prior to turning it into to, to get our beer and wine license. So, yeah, you know, but that's, I think, the mentality of the immigrants back then because we weren't really thinking legal issues. We weren't thinking things. I think when the first wave of immigrants come, they're not prepared. They're just like, let's, let's get all, hard. yeah, let's just work hard, put our money together, and do a business. Now, with the new generation, I think, of Asians, yeah, get a business plan because I think this, this generation are, are way more educated than we were ever going to be. So they should get a business plan um, and get advice. I mean, go out, talk. If you want to open a restaurant, work in a restaurant for a while. Make sure this is what you really, really want to do. And then start doing the research on how to put it together. Uh, uh, and get mentors to help you, you know, navigate through leases, uh, business license, uh, getting your beer and wine license. These are all hard steps to take. And if you don't, uh, if you don't do it, it's just going to make it double the effort to, to get it all done. You know, so. Wahoo's menu has changed over the years, but not much. The core of their philosophy remains the same. I mean, it, it's, it's evolved very, I mean, if you look, grab the menu from uh, November 1988, the menu really hasn't grown that much. And I think it's because, uh, in, in my humble opinion, we started in a good spot. It's just good, healthy, tasty food that's of value. And I think that's just sort of is, is always an option for families and, and, and you know, working professionals. And, so we've, we've tailored it, added, I mean, I, of course today everybody loves spice, right? So er, we've had to heat up the menu, uh, no pun intended, quite a bit just to stay in that category. But, but outside of that, I think our menu is pretty core to what we started in November 88. Important tips that helped them succeed not only had to do with their product, but their handling of the business aspect. One of the key things about how we were able to grow and like our parents is my mom and dad never really got more than elementary school education where the three of us are all college grads and we, you know, we've all studied finance, business, and accounting. So we kind of were able to take a business approach to a restaurant because, you know, we can all laugh about restaurants failing because they don't have good food, but most restaurants fail because they don't know how to run a business. And that would apply to almost any business anyway. It's whether you're a doctor, an attorney, it's still a business. So you really have to spend a little bit of time understanding finances, accounting, management to really be able to grow your business. And the key to business is not only knowing the business side, is communication. Is to make sure that everybody's on the same page at all the time. So whether you can do a fish taco is great, but can the other 30 people that work for you make the same fish taco? So the training and the communication and making sure that everybody's you know, in the same page is creating processes, make sure people are following, but the key to it all is great communication. 
They also invest heavily in the community and give back when they can. They say it always comes back in spades in a meaningful way. I do know the charity work that we've done basically started with our customers asking us, hey, would you help us with MS, CF, MBA, ALS? I mean, you name it, an acronym, and I know what they do, right? The benefit has been it helped our business. It helped us put a little, you know, basically help the community, help save kids' lives, make kids' lives better, uh, maybe keep the environment a little cleaner. So between education, environment, kids, I mean, we're involved with, I can't even tell you how many causes. But the side benefit, which has been hilarious, is most of the bigger nonprofits end up having great spokesmen. That's how they make more money. Use celebrity to drive more business, more uh, money to the fundraiser. So the benefit has been sitting on these committees. We've been able to meet amazing people. I'm using my resources, my tacos. They're using their professional status to do it. Hey, whatever we can all do. And it's great for the community, it's great for the charities, and it's great for business. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, after 30 years, uh, you know, nobody's getting any younger. The kids are, you know, coming up. But, you know, right now, I think we're fortunate to have a really strong staff behind us. So, we, we rely more on them for the next phase of Wahoos to continue on because honestly, uh, I don't think we have any kids that are w stepping up at the moment. They're not demonstrating the immigrant <laughs> mentality, let me say. Uh, so at, at this point, we, we, we are looking inside at the, you know, the, the, the folks who've helped us grow and, and put them in key positions. I mean, we're, we're st we still have a lot of life left in our tires, but it's probably going to be a, a combination of... Uh, uh, key management players that we have in place today. Coming up after the rave, more on the story of Wahoos and how they've managed to grow their brand in the past three decades. Welcome back to Kenyan 101. I'm your host, Twee Fan. The Wahoo story of success is a reminder of creating a niche for yourself and working in the restaurant industry. They are also an example of franchising and how well it can work if you have a great idea and follow the market trends. Join us as we talk more to the brothers and how they were able to grow their company to where it is today. The Wahoo's is a great story. You know, there's multiple versions of it, but at the end of the day, Mingo was in Hawaii. He, we've been brainstorming ideas and we couldn't come up with anything significant. Every fish that we can think of was already being used, like mahi-mahi, dorado, you know, uh, like yellowfin, yellowtail, whatever. There was something already there, and it just didn't sound like sexy. We're gonna go to yellowtails, really? And Mingo had heard in Hawaii the word ono, and we thought, oh, that's a great name, it's a great fish, but we thought maybe the mainlanders would call it ono as opposed to Ono's. So it's like, okay, we're not gonna go, oh no. So the other way to say Wahoo, oh no in Hawaii is Wahoo. So he said, let's go to Wahoo's. I'm like, oh, rolls right off your tongue. Sounds cool. So that's how we came up with it. It also happens to represent the best sport fishing fish you can catch. I've probably been coming to Wahoo's for 20, 30 years. When you opened, um, when I was teaching over there in Costa Mesa, we used to take a day of once a week and go to the Wahoos on the, off 19th Street. And they started calling me Wahoo Sue because I liked it so much. And everyone said we would like fish tacos, which just sounded horrible to me, and they are wonderful. <laughs> but um, anyway, we followed it. Now my whole family comes frequently, and my son works over in Fashion Island, and he comes. and. We love coming to Wahoo's. We used to go to the one on, in Huntington Beach all the time. We love that it's here. We actually moved and we live in Maui, Hawaii now. So when we come back to mainland California, we love coming for the really fresh fish, the really good food, and it's that perfect mix between like the seafood blend, the healthy food, and a little bit of the Mexican flavor, which we love. In 2018, Wahoo's marked 30 years with an exclusive dinner held at the James Beard House, a milestone that meant a lot to their family. Working together as a family can be tough, but they say they know they have each other's backs. Working in a family business is, is super interesting because it's, a, it's hard. It, it, we really, it's, it's a struggle at times because everybody has their own personality. Um, and you can say things to your family member that you wouldn't say to a regular partner. You, 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 know, you can do a lot. It gets a little tough. But the one thing is we're family first. We've 
unfortunately I had to learn it the hard way. But we, when we get together and we're surfing or we're eating uh, dinners together, I mean, we do a lot, a lot of dinners together as a family. And you gotta have to remind yourself that as much as it pains us to, to argue at work, that's work, that's our work life. It has nothing to do with what we do at home. So we have a large family, which makes it easier to, to have all the girls and all the cousins get together. And, and when we eat, have wine, break bread, I think we are reminded at that point, why do we work so hard? Why do we continue going to work? Well, because we have a family. We have families and that's what we want to do is to continue doing that. Uh, but it's hard to go to work with your brothers uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. Now, you know, people that come to me for advice about, hey, should I open this with, the, with my brother and sister? You better like each other a lot because it's going to get some rough days. Working with family, I think part of it is it's tough, but, you know, I. I don't trust, I, Mingo, I trust Mingo more than anybody else in my life. I mean, I know that when he's playing with our money, it's, it's going to be there the next day. He might not divide it, but it's there. <laughs> and so I, we trust each other to have each other's back for sure. So our, part of our success is that three of us know at the end of the day, we have full trust of one another what we're doing. That doesn't mean that we trust each other making decisions about the work, but we trust each other in the sense of we're family. We know we're not going to... There's not enough money in the world to backstab each other when it comes to finance. So that's just silly. So that's the plus about having a family member that you trust. I mean, me and I've been partners all our lives, and we've done so many things together. Wing too. I mean, we just, you know, uh, so we have that, uh, um, and you know that you have to go have Christmas dinners together. So you better not do anything <laughs> silly, right? So the decision to franchise was a gamble, but one they felt was a right decision for their family. I think there's a lot of risks that go along with that. I mean, we've seen sort of the, the, the highs and lows of franchising, but it, it really boils down to, I mean, if, if you're a sole proprietor and you have one great restaurant, you can make a very comfortable living for your family. But, you know, in certain circumstances, if you uh, want to uh, back off and have passive income like real estate, you, you got to decide if you're going to scale your own concepts, which takes a lot of capital, a lot more risk than if you go and franchise. And again, you have to have some systems in place. But again, now somebody else is putting all their capital at risk and you're helping them, training them and supporting them. But that's, I think, the, the crossover you guys had. How much of your own capital do you want to continue to put at risk out there? For them, location is key. Well, you know, they, they, the, the key thing when it comes, when you go to business school, they say location, location, location. That That's first and most important. But then, if you're a restaurant and you don't have good food, you're not a restaurant. So it doesn't matter. It just that location is key to everything else. It doesn't. So I don't care whether you're uh, uh, whatever business you go in, you got to find your target market, and that's where it all starts. Then everything builds from there. So um, when I talk to people, like don't take, you know, uh, areas that you, you can't afford. So the location is part. Two parts is you know the, the location plus the rent base, and that's because rent does not go away it continues increasing every year so if you're not really what you know learning where you need to be that i think to me location 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 so the funny part is we're looking for people that are like-minded to our existing location so yes there's a certain amount of business that has to be around you know for the daytime the lunch business that we need certain amount of maybe entertainment shopping so maybe like a trader joe's a movie theater business that complement us and also variety I mean having hamburger places pizza places around us because then it creates kind of a synergy where people can't eat tacos every day sometimes they can and they have options because you know what I want to go to this particular mall because they got great Chinese food, great Japanese, great Mexican, great everything. So you're looking for basically demographic where people want to gather because it's about a social. You don't go out just to eat, you go out to be social. And that's where Wahoos fits in. And people that are active, beach locations are great for us. But then again, some of our best stores are nowhere near the beaches, but they're near mountain biking trails. They're near ski resorts. So these are some of the things that you think about is where do people want to have fun, they're active, and they want to have a restaurant that basically fits their lifestyle. Having made many mistakes throughout the years by trial and error, they say they'd still encourage people to go out and try their hand at being entrepreneurs. Well, getting you know, that first step, the idea of owning your own business and actually doing it, I explain to people, there's two kinds of people out there. First of all, you got to decide which one you are first. 
are you the person that can basically not worry to death that you're going to have a paycheck on Friday? If you can't handle that and you can't manage that, don't start your own business because you may or may not get a paycheck on Friday. But once you get past that hurdle, then it's the next is why you? What makes your idea unique that people want to come and support you? And then if you can explain that, I'm like, hmm, that's a great angle, right? And then filter it through because your friends will probably be the first naysayers anyway. So then go to strangers, go to your classmates, go to other people. Say, hey, if I was going to do this, what do you think? And they're like, hmm. And, and so you're either going to get a bunch of people because nobody wants to see you succeed anyway, right? Because it's their own fear, their own insecurities. So they can project that on you. So you got to decide, goes, you know what? I think I got a good idea. Nobody's doing it. Right? and whatever that service product is, and you know what, borrow a little bit of money knowing that, hey, you gotta go all in, there's no such thing as starting your own business part-time, it doesn't really work. So you gotta go all in, make sure that you have a solid idea, and have a parachute on the back end in case it doesn't work. You always gotta go back to real job, right? But most of the time, like you said, 90% of them fail anyway. And it's all because you didn't think it through. You can't over-engineer it, you just gotta make sure you have enough to know that, hey, this is gonna work or not. And go for it, because nobody knows what you don't know. We always talk about, hey, you know, do what you love and it won't be work. Trust me, it's still a ton of work, but as long as you're enjoying it and you're able to, you know, really have a fun ride, it's, it's 40, 50 years that we're gonna be doing this, right? I'm already 30 years in, I still love doing it every day. I still don't mind washing dishes, cleaning up, whatever needs to get done, I don't mind doing it, I love doing it. So that's what you wanna do. Whatever business product you do, just be behind it for the next 40 or 50 years. If you think you can't do it for that long, that's probably not a good idea. If the, the one thing when you go into business for yourself, you gotta be prepared. I mean, it probably uh, goes without saying, but put in the hours and the effort because at the end of the day, uh, you're the only one who technically is not on the payroll. I mean, your, your labor can make things happen, get things done a lot cheaper, and you may have to rely on that at the end of the day, so. All of these businesses do a great job of showing you how you can scale your business and grow if you have the right idea and quality food. They are reminders that you just need to focus and do one thing well, and the rest will follow. Join us next week as we take you to the headquarters of Sriracha and Huifang Foods and how they bring over $100 million a year in sales alone. Until next time, thanks for joining us. Thank you.